Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us uh, today. Uh, this is uh, our dialogue series, and uh, the, uh, under the team, uh, Specters of Crisis and Rays of Hope. Uh, today's topic will be a People's Green New Deal, Obstacles and Prospects. And the speaker is Dr. Max L. And the discussion will be Professor Archana Prasad. Uh, Professor Max is an associate researcher with the Tunisian Observatory of Food Sovereignty and Environment and a postdoctoral fellow with the Rural Sociology Group at Wageningen uh, University in the Netherlands. And uh, he writes on uh, the place of the countryside in global development. And, res uh, and researchers Tunisian national uh, liberation, planning and political economy, and Arab dependency theory and agrarian issues. His forthcoming book, which we are all looking forward to read it, uh, is A People's Green New Deal. It will be launched by Pluto Press. Uh, and uh, among his recent articles, we have uh, does the Arab region have an agrarian question? It's a very important issue for all of us. That was published in journal, the Journal of Peasant Studies. And the uh, hidden legacy, legacy of Samir Amin, the linking ecological foundations uh, that was published in the review of uh, uh, African political economy, the ROAP, uh, which are two uh, themes and, and, and questions that we have been dealing with in our uh, dialogue series and our debates in the Agrarian South Network. And uh, I'm discussing Professor uh, Archana Prasad is a professor at the Center of the Informal Sector and Labor Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, in India. She's also the chairperson uh, of the center, uh, was the chairperson of the center between 2014 and 2016. And uh, uh, her research is on the con uh, contemporary history of advised uh, livelihoods labor and resistance, women and labor, environmental and labor history. Uh, she has also been helping many grassroots organizations in the work with home-based workers. She's also the associate editor of the Agrarian South, the Journal of Political Economy that is behind uh, this whole initiative. And it's a, of course, the tri-continental journal published by, the, by Sage uh, Press. Uh, and in her books, we have uh, against Ecological Romances from 2011 and Environmentalism and the Left, uh, published in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to, and for all of us today, that uh, we are really having a tri-continental uh, debate today. I'm, I'm here in Brazil. Uh, Professor uh, Marx uh, is uh, speaking from Tunisia, and uh, Professor Archana Prasad uh, from India. And it's the, the real, this is the core of this network and, and the real purpose of uh, our uh, debates uh, and initiatives. Uh, our core partners in this tri-continental network are the Agrarian South Network, the Samoyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies based in Harare, Zimbabwe, and the ActionAid India. And in the three continents, we have uh, supporting partners. There's the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, the Institute of Agrarian Studies at the University of Ghana, of African Studies, sorry, at the University of Ghana, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, China, uh, the Federal University of ABC in Brazil, uh, and the program of the postgraduate program in World Political Economy. Uh, the Educational Technologies and Language Unity and the Office of the Provost of Outreach and Culture at the ABC University in Brazil, and the Tunisian Observatory uh, for uh, Food Sovereignty and Environment. Uh, for everyone joining us today, uh, we have, uh, of course, after the presentations, we will have uh, a session of questions and answers. And, uh, the dialogue will be in English, but everyone can uh, send questions to us 
through uh, the Zoom platform, the, the, the chat in Zoom platform, and through Facebook. And you can send questions in any language that will be uh, 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 translating them to the speakers. Uh, and they will, uh, our support team will forward uh, basically to the moderator, that's me today. Uh, and the recorded video will appear late, uh, both in Portuguese and uh, both with Portuguese and Spanish subtitles. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Special, special thanks to Prof, uh, Prof uh, Max Ayo and welcome to our network, to our debates. And uh, we are looking forward to hear from you today. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to, uh, to ActionAid, to OCE, to Agrarian South, to the Sam Moyo Institute and all the organizers and logistical facilitators for, um, for this invitation. Um, it is, uh, it's an honor. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, the Green New Deal today and what a people's Green New Deal might be. Um, and we're talking about a Green New Deal because uh, like a lot of concepts from the North, it becomes a reference point in some way or an object of curiosity, or at the very least, a kind of new celestial object which exerts a gravity on global environmental debates and global environmental politics. So I want to begin with discussing why we're discussing the Green New Deal in the context of the U.S. political situation and the global ecological crisis. Uh, describe the Green New Deal as one amongst uh, four possible resolutions to those crises. To describe those four resolutions at length uh, and then discuss prospects for an actual people's Green New Deal. So to start with the ecological and political context as I see it. I think the ecology becomes relevant here on two fronts. On the one hand, we have a ruling class awareness of the urgency of the ecological crisis. For example, the 2018 IPCC panel on climate change report for the first time used language which was astounding, if not almost alarming, in how much it departed from the normally conservative bureaucratic jargon of the previous syntheses reports. That document argued for rapid and far-reaching transitions, I'm quoting, in energy, land, urban, and infrastructure and industrial systems, and noted systems transitions are unprecedented in terms of scale, but not necessarily in terms of speed, and they imply deep reductions in all sectors. It added, there is no documented historic precedent for their scale. The second aspect, which we always have to keep in mind, is the background of uneven ecological exchange, which manifests as the periphery suffering from integration into the world market and the world ecological system, not merely through economic super exploitation, but also the consequences of industrialization, industrial agriculture, export of pollution, degradation of the environment, enclosure of atmospheric space, and perhaps above all, rising southern vulnerability to catastrophic disasters. The political aspects that I think are relevant are one, first, the slow relative decline of U.S. hegemony. I do not mean here the thesis, which I think is partially wrong, that the U.S. is no longer or will no lo shortly no longer be an empire. The nuclear backstop, the dollar reserve currency are proof of that. I mean instead that the rise of China alongside almost more significantly rising Chinese labor appropriation of surplus value in trade with the US indicates secular shifts in the world system. The second political aspect related to the first is the rise of a confused and confusing social democratic politics in the core. The contemporary GN GND as it emerged from the Congress emerged in a distinct political atmosphere with several facets. First, after the 2008 crisis and Occupy Wall Street, capitalism as a system of rule has been ideologically discredited in the core. This way of ruling the population has little credibility. Marxism or Western Marxism has become more popular as a way to understand and act upon that world. 
Within this fresh atmosphere, brimming with openness to redistributive politics, at least in the core, with all its limits, political avatars of non or anti-Marxist or anti-communist socialism have popped up recurrently across the North, from the US to Jeremy Corbyn to Syriza and Podemos. As is well known, the ruling classes have shattered and evaporated these challengers one after another, forcing them either into compromise, co-opting them, or sweeping them into irrelevance, but leaving behind massive, and I would argue radicalizing and internationalizing anti-systemic sentiment amongst the core populations. Of course, this is especially amongst the working class and the downwardly mobile petty bourgeois with the confusions and equivocations that can go alongside that. I now wanna conceptualize the debate using these kind of four ways of identifying responses to the climate crisis. Those four, as I see them, are a far right response based on green imperial integration, a left liberal response based on green imperial integration, small domestic redistribution in the core, and some rollout of renewable infrastructure for parts of the South. Slightly further left, there is a green social democratic proposal, which calling, calls for large, important domestic redistribution and a green Marshall Plan of sorts. Then there is a radical solution based on climate debt, sectoral degrowth in certain sectors of the core economies, and most likely delinking for the periphery. Before expanding on each, some context for how I'm interpreting them. I think these responses to the crisis, in fact, happen to rehearse in part older debates like those around the new international economic order concerning whether an internationalist response would be for social democratic integration or delinking. Furthermore, the current dominant debates lack, however, that radical edge, which was the fruit of the anti-systemic space for development opened up by the USSR and China. The current debates are the fruit of a different world balance of political forces, not merely the absence of a worldwide anti-systemic force in state power, but the isolation of the core left from the periphery left in terms of radical internationalism. Instead, very often, North-South intellectual organizational links are characterized in the negative sense by horizontal people solidarity but which sidesteps the national question, which sometimes takes the support, uh, the form of overt support for state fracturing, overt suspicion towards the legacy of development, or NGO supported chaotic concepts like extractivism. In the positive sense, North South intellectual organizational links are affected by what I think of as a form of potential class suicide, latent in Northern enthusiasm for food sovereignty and agroecology, and second, rising internationalist and anti-colonial sentiment, which is manifest in black agrarianism and anti-imperialism domestically, and the mounting pull of fourth world indigenous resurgence. These alternative polls I mentioned are either latently or explicitly radically internationalist or could indeed break in that direction. Now, schematically, the four proposals. First, they're the far right proposals. They imagine an entirely green capitalism or other mode of rule with ruling classes safe and secure in the settler states and the European core, climate change moderated enough to stave off unmanageable waves of climate refugees. Yet the material for this green upgrading is to be secured through extreme forms of environmental imperialism. These proposals range from those coming from the Australian Breakthrough Institute uh, to the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative to the Energy Transitions Commission. These proposals share several traits, partnerships between corporation and state, partnerships between corporations and so-called communities, an embrace of the national security sector, and they are embedded in national security discourse. They also manifest overt effusion about technological salvation, including opening new frontiers of land or agrarian-based Southern accumulation, and of course are based foundationally on the further hollowing out of third world sovereignty. 
Many converge furthermore on what the economist Daniela Gabor calls the Wall Street consensus, reorganizing development interventions around selling development finance to the market, escorting capital or crowding it into bonds and melting and remaking third world governments as what she calls the de-risking state and demanding states, their treasuries and their national budgets bear the burden of risk thereby removing risk from large tranches of core capitalism, which those plans mean to crowd in. This is in essence, recolonization. When it comes to land, these proposals have very specific ideas when it comes to the forests and grasslands of the periphery, imagining uses for them outside the needs manifest in the use values accessible to native and poor populations. Some imagine half earth biodiversity corrals, relying on the apartheid concept of separating humanity from what they call literally a dreamed up wild nature, a continuous hallucination of colonial capitalism for a very long time. This idea of course also comes in a red garb and it forgets that the history of humanity is the history of managed landscapes and that humans are more than capable of being very effective custodians, managers, and guardians of biodiversity. Of course, such an agenda also runs cover for a half earth agenda, which emerges from the capitalist right. Whether that takes the form of afforestation, which means putting trees where they have never been before as distinct from reforestation, which in putting trees where people think they were before, but is based on a reductionist ecology and fantasies about a lost forest world. Of course, we know now that these closed canopy forests are probably a myth in Western Europe, their supposed heartland. The tree plantations are intensely damaging to the ecology, especially water tables. And furthermore, that compulsory, uh, compulsory veganism would be intensely damaging to third world populations. If land will be land could be allotted for tree plantations, but more importantly, they're planning to use it for biofuels, a source of clean energy, supposedly. Without fail, all these reports gesture and acknowledge the competition with food and carbon drawdown as alternative uses. However, these are mandatory homage to the warnings in the IPCC report, but they in fact function as force fields of plausible deniability which then allow for a discussion and therefore a legitimization of biofuels. For example, the Energy Transitions Commission pointedly states, sustainable biofuels or synthetic fuels will need to scale up from today's trivial levels to play a major role in aviation and perhaps shipping. This is not hesitant, cautionary and conditional consideration, but this is actually full throttle embrace which is inevitable if these programs are implemented. The ETC Energy Transitions Commission National Manifesto for Australia, for example, states, full decarbonization for industries such as steel, cement, and chemicals require the use of electrification, hydrogen, bioenergy, and carbon capture and storage. The latter, of course, which does not yet exist. The EU's Energy Transitions Plan similarly moots massively increasing the biofuel mix in hard to decarbonize sectors like maritime and airborne transport. The plan from the US Senate special committee does the same while also calling pointedly for afforestation. And of course, using land for growing biofuels and planting trees for the purpose of pulling in CO2 from the atmosphere means not using that land for food crops. And this is a context of structural malnutrition in the third world. Even under the most optimistic scenarios, shifting all of the world's hydrocarbon use to biofuels would therefore cut savagely into agricultural production and water use. For India, for example, farmland for food has already, without needing to use it for biofuels, has been savagely dragooned into use for tropical export crops. In the same, the ETC also blocks out biomass for India as a possible input into Indian metallurgy. That's the first scenario. The second scenario is full renewable replacement of current energy use, 
alongside increased Southern energy use, all renewable, ongoing capitalist property structures. This is the left liberal solution and it is what the Ocasio-Cortez solution would represent once it passes through the US Congress. This also would go alongside ongoing ecological imperialism and small, if at all, climate debt. This legislation emerged, in fact, from earlier rumblings about a jobs for all program, which was a needed and sweeping populist remedy for an underpaid and underemployed, declasse or simply mired in poverty middle class. This is its appeal. The legislation itself situates itself in the context of wage stagnation, deindustrialization, and anti-labor policies, I'm quoting, alongside the need to keep climate warming below 1.5 degrees. The legislation then, quoting again, calls for a new national, social, industrial, and economic mobilization along the lines of World War II or the original New Deal, with sweeping notions of a new corporatist and core-centered social pact. Of course, the fact that it's national cannot be deployed innocently in an imperial core country. Third, of course, the legislation is not socialist and does not diagnose any systemic system as the source of these ills or the sower of any uh, social antagonisms. It calls instead for a transparent and inclusive consultation and partnership with businesses alongside adequate capital to businesses working on the Green New Deal mobilization. This is partnered with a murky call for public appropriate ownership stakes and returns on investment in such capital grants. This re reflects the equivocations and uncertainty of the current atmosphere. Four, it makes gestures to, I quote, consultation, collaboration, and partnership with frontline and vulnerable communities. Again, these words are somewhat amorphous or they're Rorschach black tests. For everyone in fact is more or less vulnerable and everyone in fact is a member of a community while frontline is an index of geographical risk. These words give off a warm aura of concern for oppression, but they are denuded of a class context. Uh, and five, it does note the historic oppression of the poor and low income workers, but again calls for resolving that oppression while keeping the fundamental structures of property in the US and needless to say internationally intact. Nation or internationalism or a bad internationalism did enter the AOC Green New Deal on two important fronts. One is a note of caution supporting the industrial green renaissance interpretation, the legislation called for, quote, promoting the international exchange of technology, expertise, products, funding, and services with the aim of making the United States the international leader on climate action. Such a call is a foretoken of the oncoming and likely maneuvering in the US state and on national and international stages. A new space race for leadership and monopoly control over technology for a green transition. The, small, the second important aspect where the national question arises is a small openness to the indigenous question. It must be noted, however, that this question is rapidly being or attempted to be encased by NGO diversity containment procedures in the, in the core. A third position is that represent, represented by the diffuse social democratic tendency, which I would not necessarily assimilate to Ocasio-Cortez. It argues for lower energy use through retrofitting core countries' infrastructure, sub substantial domestic redistribution to go back to 1950s levels of inequality, if not a transitional stage to socialism, alongside full replacement of the U.S. energy infrastructure. Internationally, this solution ambivalently embraces fourth world or indigenous decolonization a position rife with vulnerabilities and openness for anti-systemic forces, alongside an ambiguous call for grants to help Southern countries transition. This position politically defends and seeks to ride the AOC Green New Deal, but to expand it with these ambiguous commitments, both those I mentioned above, and to grassroots internationalism through supply chain justice, as well as a ambiguous or sometimes more forthright commitment to demilitarization. The fourth solution, 
the radical solution, suggests considerably lower energy use in the core alongside de decommodified social infrastructure, guaranteed social well-being in the core, and massive aid and technology grants uh, uh, to the third world through comprehensive climate debt. This is a form of large-scale radical ecological management, which, as we shall see, intertwines with a renewed defense of sovereignty leaning on indigenous and agroecological knowledge and land management, comprehensive demilitarization, and worldwide decolonization. I will now expand on that fourth option. Because the world system is divided, we are constantly presented in the core with recurrent deviations into support for rallying behind the flag. A divided world in terms of economic interests necessarily produces divided and lopsided politics and consciousness. This is neither mechanical, teleological or necessary, but it is true historically. So in the second half of the presentation, I wanna lay out programmatic elements for a people's Green New Deal and the complementary burdens of transformation they imply in the North and South to fight back and provide intellectual and political self-defense against that trajectory. As postulates, I begin with three points. One, the only legitimate aim is world scale developmental convergence on permanently sustainable ecological basis within a relatively egalitarian world and with each country or region having sovereign industrialization. Therefore, what we need to do, I think, is reverse engineer that outcome and think about what kinds of political, social, and technological interventions are needed to arrive at it. Second, politics starts with location, thereby implying distinct but complementary tasks. Three, agriculture and land use management are central to this process and this transition, hence my emphasis on them. This does not imply a rejection of sovereign ecologically modulated industrialization, but is merely a question of emphasis. In this way, central to developmental convergence, uh, is the national question, which I might separate out into three elements for the purpose of this presentation. That of national liberation with substrands of imperial, of peripheral and core decolonization. Second, a renewed sovereignty system, which manifests as the gains, a defense of the gains of decolonization. And three, a national question, which we see emerge through questions of climate debt, which interacts recursively with this demand and need for a renewed defense of peripheral sovereignty. Of course, the agrarian question weaves in and out of those concerns, including the agrarian questions, sub-questions related to land, labor, ecology, and gender. I want to first now expand on the GND, the Green New Deal, and the national question in its various aspects. Of course, it's important to note that colonialism itself is not over. It endures de jure in a plethora of settler states. And in the North American settler states, indigenous struggles at Standing Rock and in Idle No More have actually been generational catalysts for far broader consciousness, consciousness amongst non-indigenous radicals of the indigenous simmering national question. Importantly, it has been amongst indigenous people that rights to use values are intertwined with the national question, intertwined with rights to land, intertwined with the call for land back. This specific national question also has an ecological component since the largest arenas of biodiversity preservation on a proportional basis are indigenous managed land, both in the core and on a world scale. I do not mean here to reduce indigenous people to any kind of agent or beneficiary of a restored prelapsarian ecology, but say this while insisting, quoting indigenous scholars, Andrew Curley and Marjorie Lister, that they are emphatically modern peoples whose greatest threats are political marginalization at the hands of continued colonial processes. Nevertheless, the scope here for anti-systemic politics, taking them as a point of departure and orienting poll is potentially immense. So what, because what is being discussed here is nothing less than the reversal of the historic process of primitive accumulation. 
The second major theme around the national question is renewed sovereignty. This is crucial in the current moment because nation states the are the political container through which accumulation on a world scale and uneven accumulation endure, persevere, and deepen. Nation states structure uneven access to the fruits of world production. Furthermore, nations like Yemen, Iraq, the Democratic Republic of Congo, or Venezuela face national losses in their productive forces as well as nations, as sanctions and war. Furthermore, the nation is one of the political and social units within which people organize to resist oppression. As has been documented repeatedly, a large portion of the most dynamic struggles of the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s, including, of course, Zimbabwe, have used a national popular idiom to describe their politics, speak to their people, struggle for change, and place domestic wealth at the service of the popular classes. Furthermore, highlighting the salience of nation, it has perhaps underappreciated that the most globally cherished and shared sh and supported struggle for liberation and justice, that of the Palestinians, is that of a subjugated nation fighting for land, liberation, and return. This will tie into the ecological question when we see that there is no hope for Palestinians or Yemenis to receive, control, manage, and direct climate debt reparations unless they have de facto and du jour national sovereignty, the political shell within which thinking about the future can occur. It is in and through the national political sphere that certain decisions must be made about ecological planning, alliances built, and internationalism constructed. To take another example, it matters very much here who helms Bolivia. It was a sovereign and national popular indigenous led nation state, which was the sanctuary for the Cochabamba People's Agreement. And of course, it is through the nation that are calculated, ecological uh, demands for ecological debt repayments are made. Focusing on the national question, brings us, of course, to the, the right to regain control of a people's historical process and for people to decide how and with whom they want to live. And of course, to ensure that that decision is made by them and not by a more powerful nation or for that matter, a colonizing nation. I would add here that defending the national question in this specific sense does not deny the social or democratic questions internally who gets what within nations, who decides who gets what within, within each nation, and the ecological texture of national production and distribution, or a lot of the concerns that are often placed under the umbrella of extractivism. Instead, it is simply affirms the hierarchical structuring of the world system. Furthermore, it affirms that there has been a historical sovereignty deficit in other states, states which has been a, leg uh, a legacy of the colonial system and has been reproduced under neocolonialism. In this form, the national question in the periphery and the defense of sovereignty with which it is connected requires struggle. This is why it cannot be disconnected at all from what would be a very provincial Northern climate politics if that climate politics ignores Southern struggles as is often currently the case. This is because these rights are not merely possessions and are not merely abstractions, but because they are relationships. And any right of the third or fourth, fourth world implies first world respect for that right, including the political struggle to secure such respect. That is the rights imply corollary responsibilities and burdens of transformation. Like the seal rights at Standing Rock meant people had to go and stand with the indigenous people fighting for control of their national resources. Or if Palestinians have a right to national liberation and self-determination, there is an implied obligation to assist that struggle, including identifying the manacles which extend to or were forged by the core nations which enchain the Palestinians. In that sense, whether we consider GND's just local plans 
or whether they can be scaled up into a global architecture for just transition, all parties must shoulder the burden of transformation, which includes, of course, assessing ways in which uneven accumulation has contributed to a lopsided form of development in the core, including the export of the ecological consequences of first world development. In turn, we also have to focus here uh, on a certain crucial programmatic aspect of uh, this struggle and the, the mutual burdens and obligations. This implies a recovery in radical developmental thought and practice of that quintessential development which came from the third world, which was the agreed upon and consensual banner for radical ecological transformation from a decade ago, climate debt as a component of ecological debt. Climate debt or ecological debt is based on understanding that capitalist production and consumption in the wealthy world has vastly overrun the world's space, space for waste, including critically the atmospheric space for that waste product of fossil capitalism, carbon dioxide. Climate debt more specifically refers to the appropriation or enclosure of world capacity to absorb greenhouse gases with staggering implications for the poor world's development path, including the inability to replicate cheap access and use of fossil fuels. This is the emissions component of the climate debt. There's also an adaptation debt, the resources needed for poor countries to try to tamp down control and respond to the rising seas, typhoons, and other environmental dislocations produced by the wealthy world's development path. A decade ago, the Cochabamba People's Process Working Group laid out a five-point program based precisely on calculating and honoring these debts. The five key demands were first, the task of returning occupied atmospheric space, to decolonize the atmosphere by reducing and removing emissions, to allot remaining atmospheric space fairly, and to account for dual and potentially dueling needs or demands for both development space and equilibrium for Mother Earth. They also called for honoring the debts which reflect lost development opportunities, since the cheap development paths blazed by the wealthy countries to build up their infrastructure could not be rewalked by the, by the poor countries, even on a purely environmental basis. Three, to honor the debts related to the destruction caused by climate change. Four, as much as possible, to honor adaptation debts, including the costs of providing means for people to stay at home and have decent lives within their own countries. Five, to refuse to isolate and purify the climate crisis as though it can be distilled out from the broader ecological crisis. And to honor these debts that were agreed in the Cochabamba process as a promissory note on the broader ecological debt to Mother Earth. A Northern social scientist, Ricard Warlenius, took the Cochabamba positions as the basis for a first draft quantification of the climate debt. If space in the atmosphere had been calculated fairly, the North or the Annex I or essentially the OECD countries could only have emitted 15% of what they have actually emitted. Of course, the South could have emitted not by a lot, only about 4.4%. In numerical terms, as of 2008, the North had over emitted 746.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide. As of 2008, at a carbon price equivalent of $50 per ton, the value of the historical carbon debt would have been around 37.3 trillion. The IPCC estimates 
that a carbon price of between $150 and $600 is required to keep global warming between one point, below 1.5 Celsius. Those numbers then, or that price, would increase the size of the climate debt owed to the South enormously to 112 trillion at the low end or 448 trillion at the high end. More concretely, Bolivia demanded the provision of financial resources by developed countries to developing countries amounting for capacity building and mitigation, 6% per year. US GMP in 2019 was 21.6 trillion. 6% 6 of that are debt payments of 1.3 trillion. OECD GMP, roughly equivalent to Annex 1, was at that point about 54 trillion. 6% of that would be debt repayments of 3.24 trillion per year. These are calls for revolution. In concluding then, I want to discuss how climate, uh, how land management and agri agriculture are central to the just transition. There is first the under-remarked point that if third world agrarian systems were oriented toward the needs of their laboring classes rather than luxury and raw goods exports to the north, and if land must be tended in order to deal with it properly, we would see a much higher percentage of core populations in agricultural labor. And it could be lower. Second, the second reason it's central is that it is increasingly clear that the path, meaning worldwide land to the tiller agrarian reforms, paying particular attention to gender inequalities, and ideally, but not necessarily through cooperatives, is the only path to third world development and an escape from underdevelopment. It is, as I see it, the only way to secure a surplus for sovereign industrialization. It is the only way to feed hungry national populations. Of equal importance, agroecological farming and attention intensive land management can increase yields while reducing labor inputs and substituting for them what we can call attention inputs. This has now been proven empirically in Cuba, a lighthouse which merits emulation on a world scale. From a productive aspect, ecological land management can produce a great deal of the raw materials needed for sovereign manufacturing and industrialization, freeing up capital and if necessary, uh, imports for, uh, for heavy industrialization, renewable energy transition, transitions, and national and regional transport systems, including arresting thereby rural urban imbalances. And this is in the third world. By shifting where possible to the processing of biotic or living as opposed to abiotic materials, this opens the way to sidestep or perhaps leapfrog the ecologically destructive industrial path walked by the North based on gratuitous use of ore over industrialization, if we understand that using dead materials, planned obsolescence, and of course, environmentally uneven exchange. There are other very important aspects to this kind of uh, centrality of agriculture agroecological farming and soil tending and land management, active intensive land management forestry are far more hospitable for agrobiodiversity. This fact is now established beyond all doubt and is almost certainly why indigenous managed lands where there is less agricultural modernization do so well on biodiversity indicators. A second less well-known aspect is that agroecologically managed lands are more drought resilient and more resilient to flooding because the soil retains moisture. This will be a gift beyond value in an age of global warming induced climactic chaos, an age of floods and droughts. Third, and by way of conclusion, and this is a bit of historical poetic justice, through these processes, through these facts, through these mechanisms, we can see that peasant or small farmer agroecology 
which has, has been proven to pull CO2 from the atmosphere, as can attention intensive pastoralism. The limits of these facts are not known. The upper bounds of the process may indeed be enough to bring atmospheric CO2 levels down to early industrial levels. It would then be somewhat ironic that it would be small peasant, the small peasant class, the preserver of so-called traditional agricultural knowledge, and the class so often spit upon as merely a relic, a barely surviving relic of the past, which holds in her hand the keys to the future of humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. And uh, now we can proceed to the to the comments of Professor Achana Prasad. Thank you, Achana. You can speak now. Mm. Thank you, Marcelo, and thank you, Max, for that really interesting presentation. Uh, so I've got a whole lot of notes scribbled here, which I'll try to put. Uh, in some order so that I can sort of push you into explaining what you mean by certain things a little uh, more because you have had very less time to speak. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, when we look at the discourse on the ecological crisis, as you rightly said, the Contemporary debate on climate justice and climate change is only one aspect of it. And the way in which it has taken shape, as you yourself put it, uh, in this very sort of macro international political economy perspective, where there are views from the North and ruling class views, and then there are views from different social movements and uh, working classes of the South. And uh, uh, also the debates within the uh, ruling classes, that is the international uh, uh, oligarchs and the bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie about questions of environment development, the right to development, of the South, that is the way in which the climate change has conventionally been seen also. And for a long time, uh, progressive uh, scholarship looked at the climate, uh, climate crisis as a first world conspiracy uh, in order to, uh, to sort of deprive the South of its uh, development rights. I mean, to a certain extent, if you take the first uh, two perspectives that you uh, sort of elaborated in the uh, early part of your talk, especially the first perspective, uh, it sort of uh, says that on the left, so-called left liberal perspective, it, under which you put the GND. Uh, in fact, today I read again the GND document which had been presented to the, uh, 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 to the US Congress by AOC and her compatriots. And one thing that I found striking, which actually um, makes me a bit worried about putting it as a left liberal perspective, is that, first of all, it almost says, it's a, it talks about equity and all this, but it doesn't really talk about the measures, except for a few taxes, on the corporate use of natural resources within America or outside America. So, uh, uh, so I was wondering whether, uh, uh, of course, GND is much better than Trumpism and all kinds of other things that we know, but it's not. Uh, it's not really a transformative perspective, as you would probably agree. Also that is not a transformative perspective and perhaps it's not a transformative perspective because in fact the climate crisis when we look at it in the contemporary um, uh, 
debate from the perspective of the North sort of doesn't really look at questions of imperialism and things like that, which you've also been uh, uh, mentioning. So I was just wondering whether um, uh, uh, American or a European perspective, there is something called a social democratic perspective on climate crisis, or you have a sort of a centrist right perspective and you have far more progressive uh, perspectives that constitute a dichotomy. That's one issue that I wanted to raise. And then the other point that I really sort of uh, uh, liked was the whole, uh, my first question was about the discourse in the North itself. Uh, of course, I'm aware that from the, from the South, in fact, there's a whole lot of diverse radical perspectives that are present in this debate. The um, second issue that you raised about delinking and national sovereignty, obviously, uh, no progressive perspective could disagree with that broad conclusion. But, uh, but I would like to push you a little further. You sort of mentioned the question of unequal accumulation. But unequal accumulation is not only between the North and the South. The patterns of unequal development within countries. I feel that the ecological crisis has to be contextualized in that. And it cannot only be linked to the broader debate. So for example, I'm suggesting that actually the layers of the ecological crisis are such that without sort of looking, uh, taking a standpoint on the way in which inequities are reproduced within national boundaries, I think it's very difficult to explain the problem of ecological crisis. For example, and I think you did not really uh, get into it a lot, but uh, uh, one thing that I would like to say, with the worsening crisis of the economy, the ecological crisis is also worsening. So on one hand, we had a situation where we were arguing that rampant industrialization is leading to ecological crisis. But today, the uh, question of the labor nature relation has become center stage in the ecological crisis. And I think that that question needs to be addressed uh, in a far more focused way if we want to even imagine a different world order, if we want to even imagine a different uh, world order. So I would say, that the question of from which standpoint you reconstruct the ecological crisis or the climate crisis is an important question. And it's not only an ideological question from the North or the South, but even from the South. Within the working classes, there are contradictions. And in, from within those contradictions, what position are we taking? How our resolution of the of uh, e economic in uh, our addressing of e economic inequities or even the alternatives that you are suggesting will resolve those contradictions is an important uh, issue that I think we need to take on board in the current debate. And linked to that is my third. Uh, uh, issue, which is about the programmatic aspect of the alternative. I'm fully aware and I totally on principle agree with the fact that agroecological cooperatives could be one way of thinking about an alternative path of national development. Of course there could be, but a just ecological transition has also to be a just social transition. 
not only from the point of view of inequalities between communities, but also within communities. So, for example, I would say that the so-called ecologically uh, um, uh, friendly uh, Adivasi practices in India are not at all gender friendly practices. So the uh, whole question of, say, uh, what kind of burdens the alternatives would put, how would, how would they address the crisis of social reproduction and the power relations within production systems? And uh, uh, what do they, so uh, what we're then talking about is not only about redistribution of land or land reforms, but the manner in which the agroecological alternative becomes also socially transformative. So that was, I, I would like to know your thoughts on that aspect also, because uh, we have had several experiments in India on these issues and uh, we have had uh, uh, several debates also on the labor processes and the patterns of these alternatives and what they actually do to, uh, to gender relations or relations within tribes or relations within castes and how do we plan to actually address the conflicts that arise uh, out of it? Because our non-capitalist imagination, our non-capitalist imagination has to uh, address that issue from a movement point of view. If we don't address that issue, then we can have a blueprint and an alternative. But the strategy to achieve that is going to be very very, very difficult without uh, that. So that was the third uh, issue. So uh, uh, lastly, the whole question of imperialism then has to be foregrounded, I feel, in the whole question of the layers of imperialism and the way in which they reveal themselves lie right at the lowest possible uh, sort of strata of our economic structure or the most oppressed one. And I guess the issue of the commons has to be then addressed. What kind of commons are we going to then talk about that put less burden on women that address the questions of local accumulation also, not only accumulation at the national and the international uh, level. I think I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice to both to, uh, to hear you both and uh, to, to listen to you and to and it's it's really good when we have like uh, commentators that really complicates uh, uh, the narrative the, uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, it's, it was uh, of course uh, Max gave us uh, an overview of uh, uh, his perspective and now of course he'll be able to answer and, and to engage into your comments but uh, thank you for uh, bringing us the perspectives from uh, uh, within the South or the Southern perspectives. Of course, the case of India is really nice to, to hear from. But now we, we can go, go back to Max and then we open the floor for new questions, comments and answers uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the, the sequence. Thank you, Max. Yeah, so thank you for these um, somewhat challenging questions. Um, in terms of um, how to understand, uh, situate the, the Ocasio-Cortez Green New Deal. I mean, I think this is, you know, there's an element of the, the rightward shift of left liberalism in the United States, because I think left liberalism is not uh, necessarily referring to particularly fixed political coordinates um, in, in the sense that 
other political terms might. I think left liberalism is just means uh, slightly to the left of whatever is mainstream liberalism, which is very much identified institutionally with the Democratic Party. Um, it, it, so in, it, it's in this very narrow sense that I was using it. Uh, for me, left liberalism is not in that sense meant as a compliment um, or uh, to praise this uh, specific program. I think um, particularly as it gets pulled to the right, uh, if it indeed starts passing, working its way through the U.S. Congress, then it will be uh, in many, it'll be fundamentally uh, disastrous. Um, we're already seeing it with uh, with the climate plan for uh, the Biden presidency, which is basically uh, selectively appropriating certain elements from the uh, the Ocasio Cortez uh, Green New Deal, and actually making it worse while foregrounding the even more foregrounding even more questions of uh, uh, imperialism, militarism. Um, the national security orientation, which was never effectively challenged, um, foregrounding this question of clean tech leadership, which is of course in the, which was in the Ocasio Cortez Green New Deal. So, um, it, you know, I think the the social democratic demarcation is much harder in the U.S. precisely because it has chosen to. Uh, I'm here. I'm speaking very specifically about U.S. politics, but it is very much often riding or affiliating itself directly with the Ocasio-Cortez Green New Deal on the one hand, and on the other hand, it labels itself very often as eco-socialism. So there's a huge um, morass of confusion uh, in the debate itself and amongst even people who are very involved in the debate about which uh, positions represent what. Um, so the, the social democratic alternative does have these programmatic interventions, which are somewhat to the left of uh, the Ocasio-Cortez around supply chain, uh, internationalism, um, at least, Occasionally, a very muted call for uh, climate debt. Um, you know, uh, often um, a slight hesitance around uh, hesitance around imperialist interventions and so forth. I mean, this is the this is the nature of this very the very confused public sphere debate around what is social democracy in uh, in the U.S. It's affiliated with whoever's articulating it widely, very often in the public sphere and at the political level. Um, but it also is, like I said, I think it's very much, um, I think it's rife with contradictions. I mean, I think the fact that it has decided to selectively embrace the uh, indigenous decolonization is, uh, is, is potentially opening the space, uh, a larger amount of anti-systemic space. And I think there's also a question of political, political development in the US political sphere itself. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, the, these questions and the people who are articulating certain perspectives, a lot of it is, uh, in the realm of contestation. Um, I mean, I take, I, I take the critique um, about, you know, uh, it could be suggested that uh, just simply embracing agroecology purely on technical or ecological terms is reductionist or a form of economism or ecologism or technicism. I mean, I know, uh, you know, as I understand in India, it's extremely acute at the moment with um, certain forces who are in favor of agroecology having quite reactionary politics in, in several spheres. So I don't mean to reduce it to that, which is um, why I was highlighting this question of land to the tiller agrarian reforms and breaking the spine of the landed bourgeois and necessary element of that process. So it's not merely reduced to a specific uh, form of ecological management, but does have social aspects. Um, and I think uh, the question of the nature of the political formations that will carry out this process, I only meant to lay out in very schematic terms. And um, I overemphasize the technical question because very often uh, most people aren't aware of these technological technical aspects of peasant farming, which lend themselves to both resilience and uh, cure of many of the ecological ills of capitalist uh, industrial agriculture. This is the uh, question of the emphasis, but I take what you're saying, and I think this is a question, what does uh, diversity and uni unity and diversity or diversity and unity, and how is it dealing with all the internal contradictions, including internal contradictions uh, within the working class um, and the uh, gender contradictions within the working class. And the, the process of arriving at unity um, and working through those contradictions is um, you know, it needs to be dealt with both in fora like uh, 
I mean, internationally in places like uh, La Via Campesina, also locally as people work through the contradictions and in the reconstitution of left projects on national and then international scales. Um, I mean, it's very clear that this is, it, this is not currently happening in an adequate way, um, even within countries. I mean, it's certainly not happening in, in, in the US um, or elsewhere. Um, in terms of this question of um, imperialism or layers of imperialism, I would push back a little bit on this way of framing it. I mean, I, I would want to retain a notion of imperialism as South-North value transfer, um, whereas uh, rather than, uh, you know, having a series of internal value transfers and so just an endless uh, series of connected chains um, all the way from the small, most oppressed people in the South to the richest people in the North. I mean, I do think it's important to hold on to the North-South or core periphery or, you know, uh, core, core semi-periphery, periphery, periphery uh, ideal types or uh, categorizations or typologies around understanding and conceptualizing the process of value transfer while also holding on to which sectors are super exploited, particularly through mechanisms of gender oppression um, and, and case oppression in a country like India um, or uh, the indigenous question in uh, Latin America or the, um, or the question, the black struggle in Brazil and so forth. I mean, I think these are absolutely crucial um, uh, and uh, me not mentioning them did uh, not, would not mean to indicate that I don't find them absolutely essential to conceptualizing what resistance looks like because it's precisely has to account for an inclusive ecological society that is based on eliminating the, all forms of exploitation, including those suffering under uh, mounded or an interlocking um, and articulating forms of oppression. But I, I mean, I very much appreciate both the bringing that, those questions to the panel and having the opportunity to clarify it. Thank you, uh, Max. And now the, the, the floor is open. And uh, Ricardo, uh, uh, Ricardo, you can uh, you can make your question now, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Max, for uh, that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and I and I want to uh, uh, sort of build on uh, what uh, Professor Prasad has said. And I want to come back to your notion of national liberation. And I want to explore with you if we can in the 21st century still think in terms of national liberation as a bounded uh, unit. Uh, because uh, one can suggest that imperialism sort of renders uh, national boundaries obsolete if you look at the mi migration flow of surplus population. Uh, uh, how do you deal with people from uh, other countries and, and sort of engage with the notion of the limits of nationalism? Uh, should we think about national liberation and extend its boundaries in terms of regional uh, sort of units if you think about, about Southern Africa as opposed to national liberation for Zimbabwe or Zambia? Should we think in regional terms and then even extend that a little bit bro uh, broader? Because I think the way in which imperialism already is organizing uh, production and how it is uh, penetrating, it sort of ruptures this uh, bounded unit already if you think in people, not things. You know, uh, and, and that renders like in, if you take, for example, South Africa, the xenophobic attack against Zimbabwean workers, uh, it lends itself to that type of uh, notion. And I want to, to explore, and my related question is, uh, if we think about uh, this notion of a metabolic shift or uh, the, the impact of that. So for example, and, and I'm using examples that I'm more familiar with. So South Africa is dependent on the suitable water uh, uh, and, and, and it creates its own internal dynamic, not in terms of an imperialist uh, relation, but how uh, life is already integrated and, and, and shifting our way in terms of uh, uh, and, and, and thinking of an ecological way out of this. So, so my point again comes to the second one is, 
the way in which imperialist production is structured renders a lot of these things about sovereignty and self-enclosed spaces a bit obsolete. And I wanted to explore with you that. And the last point is, how do you uh, see the uh, People's Green No Deal intersecting with those who argue for an eco-socialist uh, alternative? And where would you locate, locate that within uh, the broad eco-socialist uh, de debate and uh, perhaps my last point and you can choose which ones you want to answer is that there are real existing struggles happening right uh, and, and there's this view that what one can develop uh, approaches and theories within those existing struggles but as Professor Prasad also pointed out there are some limits and contradictions within that and and I uh, you have talked about the Cochabamba and all of this that you're drawing but I'm Thinking is there are the struggles that you think about one can uh, that that the people's new green deal lends itself that one can see in action already there's elements of that emerging uh, through real existing struggles in the way in which people are organizing themselves so thank you but in any case thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what, uh, what my Max pr uh, would prefer, but uh, I would say that I was expecting to make a sort of round of questions, but Ricardo uh, himself made a round of questions <laughs> a whole round. So uh, I think, Max, you can answer and then we can go back to a second round uh, with uh, shorter questions. Thank you. Yes. So thank you. Thank you again for these challenging questions. Um, um, I think there is, uh, of course, the, the national liberation struggles were, I mean, uh, certainly in the Arab region were classically, uh, there was, of course, as in many other places in the world, splits between uh, regionally oriented national liberation struggles and uh, national liberation struggles, which um, had to take place within the ambit of, or aimed only to uh, take over state power. And then there, of course, um, variations of the nationalism with emerged there. Um, and of course, the, the more regional struggles were the ones that were attacked most aggressively by imperialism to try to force them into uh, national silos in order to limit their geogra geographic breadth, in order to reduce the strategic depth. Um, and so I think it's, uh, I quite agree. I quite agree with conceiving um, national liberation along implicitly regional lines or uh, nested circles of belonging, like uh, with Nasser, uh, with Nasserism, with you know all its lights and shadows. Um, I, you know, I think I think the post-colonial nationalism itself was internally contested even once it was placed into these silos. Um, there were those tendencies that were still fighting for uh, a sense of what it meant to be uh, Egyptian or Tunisian meant that you also were fighting in equal measure for Palestinian national liberation, right? So that was an integral component of the nationalism itself on the radical edge of it. And of course, uh, in equal measure because of the internal uh, Thermidor and the external world counter-revolution, those nationalisms were never able to bloom into fully fledged uh, anti-systemic projects. I would not go so far as, as to say that imperialism is rendering um, nationalism uh, or national liberation or national sovereignty um, a, a bit obsolete. I think this I think this overstates it because there's too many arenas within which the national question is a necessary battlefield upon which anti-systemic movements have to struggle. It doesn't mean it's the only battlefield and it doesn't mean it's a huge mistake to reduce it, uh, the battlefield to this specific question of what you can and can't do within uh, holding the state and defending national sovereignty. I mean, there's an element of conservatism to that struggle, but at the same time, I mean, uh, it, you know, the region where I'm most enmeshed politically is the Arab region. Um, and it's precisely national units that have individually come under attack um, that have basically leveled the entire productive forces of entire countries one at a time, right? right? From uh, Palestine, then U.S. sowing war in Lebanon, and then Iraq, and then Libya, um, and now 
Yemen um, and Syria, right? So it's one by one, what is being attacked is the legal and juridical and the political uh, right of sovereignty itself. So in that specific sense, I think there's no option but to defend sovereignty. And I think defending sovereignty has a very sharp anti-systemic edge in that moment because it's precisely the legal and uh, political aspects of sovereignty which provide the casing within which popular development can flourish and people can actually have decent lives. I mean, it's an attack on people's livelihoods when the state collapses in portions of the Syrian countryside. Right? I mean, this directly affects social reproduction because the state is no longer able to carry out um, any form of agricultural planning, right? So this is a direct attack. The, the attack on the state qua state becomes an attack directly on social reproduction, including the weakest amongst the nation, right? So, um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's obsolete at all. I think there, there's we need to engage creatively with the problem. Um, and I think that's a different thing which does involve recovering um, regional ways of conceiving of the problem. Um, uh, in, in terms of the people's GND versus eco-socialism, um, I mean, the people's GND is fitting into, is, is a way of framing um, this eco-socialism, essentially. Um, it's, uh, I mean, this is how it's legible in the, in the core. Uh, people, you know, people are interpreting socialism through the GND. In fact, Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal was labeled eco-socialist uh, in portions of the U.S. left, if you can believe it. Um, this was kind of a bit of an invention. But nevertheless, it's uh, one, I mean, it's a way of making it legible. And it's two, you know, the eco-socialist debate, of course, can also be very parochial and, um, and imperialist and chauvinist itself. So it's more than anything, it's a question of, um, of legibility. Professor Achana wants to make a point. She requested it, so please. No, no, I just uh, want to make my position on the national question clear. I think that the national question is still a really important question. I tend to agree with Max, but my only small point in that is that uh, uh, you can only de-link and make the national question important if the working classes also reclaim the nation for themselves. That's all. I, that was just a clarification that I want to make that uh, the nation for whom and how. So reclaiming the nation is an important project that the left of center forces have to deal with today if they want to really deal from the imperialist globalization project. That's all. Thank you, Archana. And uh, uh, now I use uh, what was my, my own privilege to make a question and to make a point. And uh, it's, uh, it was very nice uh, and it's, it's very uh, ex exciting to listen to you. In a, in a country like ours, uh, in countries like ours, we have been facing like at, at least contradictory uh, discourses on, uh, green, uh, uh, on, a, on a greener development. And of course, in the case of Brazil, uh, uh, some of the debates we are, uh, uh, listen uh, now, especially the, the, the questions made by the, of course, our strange and conservative government is uh, that uh, to make anything green in the country would mean, uh, you know, and you mentioned that, would mean uh, follow the international NGOs agendas and, and it will be not, it, will, it won't be national at all. Uh, but at the same time, this is the same government who supported Trump uh, up to the end and is still supporting this sort of initiative. So it, first is like, uh, and I, I, would, uh, I think I would agree with Archana that uh, even within the South, we have our own contradictions. Uh, and of course, the, the ways in which we, we are now re-elaborating the national questions. Uh, uh, you, you, of course, you mentioned Bolivia. That is, I think, I would I would say that's the in the continent here, and uh, of course in the Americas. Uh, it seems that Argentina and Bolivia are like getting back on some sort of politics we, we had before, but at the same time, most of the countries which in which we are uh, residing and working, and 
organized and intellectually, uh, uh, a lot of, and, uh, and that's my point, a lot of uh, intellectual politics is needed. And most of us, I would say, in, in this moment, we are not divided and we are not clear uh, on how to engage with this international uh, agendas and international coalition. So my, really, my, my broad question, uh, broad question to you is, uh, of course, there are glimpses in your uh, uh, presentations, we, we could listen to that, but just to, uh, to uh, ask you to elaborate a bit more on that, but because what sort of uh, software intellectual politics uh, do you imagine or uh, do you uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, do you, in a very uh, straightforward way, uh, would you imagine for us uh, uh, to engage with? Uh, what sort of intellectual politics we need uh, in order to deal with the, the imposition and at the same time the, 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 the fact that we need greener policies and we need, uh, but we also need development and we also need to position ourselves in this uh, uh, worldwide uh, debate, uh, the post-colonial uh, debate uh, in our own economies. But uh, the broad question is this, uh, and of course you mentioned that the linking option, but uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on uh, uh, how can we engage ourselves and what's, what are the possibilities for a southern intellectual politics or in a southern uh, delinked uh, uh, intellectual politics? Uh, thank you, Max. I think Paris has a question to uh, Marcelo. Yes, I, yeah, uh, after Paris, then I would uh, uh, want to engage Max on some of the things that he said. Yeah, so let uh, Paris go first and then me. All right, Paris, you can proceed. Okay, I, I think um, I will, my connection is uh, very weak. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Thank you, Max, for a really wonderful exposition on so many issues um, which uh, have uh, uh, been uh, going around for so long in, in, in so many other directions. And I think you brought it home in a really, in a, in a strong way. So I thank you for that. Um, the, just a few quick thoughts. The, uh, when, we, when we speak of the world economy in the world system, uh, the, the elephant in the room is all, I mean, that's the main agent of contemporary capitalism, these big monopolies. And I cannot see um, much in the proposals that are coming from uh, the North in terms of uh, breaking the back of these monopolies. I think it's, there's no, these ideas about taxing this and that, uh, it may have even some value in the short term as long as it lasts, but then uh, the relations of power have not changed. Things revert to point zero. So that's the one thing. I think whatever proposal comes from the North, um, it has to break the back of, of, of the monopolies. These are co huge corporations which need to be... Uh, nationalized, broken down, redistributed their assets in, around the world and so forth. I mean, it's a, it's a, that's, we need to be thinking about how to break the back of these multinationals. Uh, and then on that, on that, then we can actually, uh, where the initiatives will come from. Um, and of course, the national question, if um, there is a generation in the North that is now on a radical track, there's, of, of course, the, the national question is the liberation movement that have always put the brakes, not always, but anyway, they have the last 50 years have has been the main uh, of uh, resistance to multinationals. Of course, they've succumbed to neoliberalism, uh, but in the long durée of this experience, um, 
Or should I stop my video? Can you? Better now. Can you hear me we now? We're listening, Perry. Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I've turned off my camera again. So, um, yeah, so the, I think I agree also on the national question. Of course, there's no uh, beyond that, um, uh, even though it's permeated by the, the construction of internationalism. Uh, so that's, I think that's the, the, quite clearly, I think that's the point. Um, the, on agriculture as well, I think you've given us a nuanced uh, approach uh, without romanticizing. Uh, there is um, a real tendency, even among the most progressive movements, of uh, turning it into a single issue uh, uh, project, delinking it or delinking it um, in the sense of uh, in the banal sense of uh, of uh, separating out from the national question. Um, we've seen this in Latin America quite a bit, in fact. Social movements that have defended food sovereignty, agroecology, even in Brazil, but also Ecuador, Argentina, some social movements which have not been able to form alliances properly and they've been defeated. Yeah. Um, and you know, ideologically, <clears throat> they don't have a national liberation perspective. Yeah, so that's important. That's an important point, I think. That your your approach uh, emphasizes uh, the ideology has to have this 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 uh, has to be located in a liberation perspective, which is not uh, just a movement uh, uh, NGO type of perspective. Um, and at, finally, there is the issue of um, well, today there are all these proposals coming from the north, uh, and it seems like there's a lot of density building up in this debate. I'm uh, the question uh, um, which emerges uh, to build the Bamba, you've mentioned, and Arjuna brought um, the experience um, in India, uh, but these do not uh, either do not get connected, they don't develop together, they get fragmented, uh, and of course, um, this season that needs to happen. There needs to be, there needs to be some kind of systematic convergence in an internal dialogue from the South-South uh, dialogue on the basis of which these questions can be consolidated and taken forward. It's not that they're unproblematic. Uh, I mean, these have to be constructed uh, and the initiative has to be retaken. And I say this uh, to close, also because uh, even the currents in the US in the Democratic Party uh, have to um, um, habit a Biden presidency uh, with which they will have to make deals, probably, uh, and they're in a different uh, dynamic. And maybe it's, it, was, it was easier with Trump to, to be uh, radical and so forth. Now, they may, the, the co-optation forces are, are, are even escalate at this present juncture. So I leave that in as a provocation for you to comment as you wish. Thank you. Uh, Paris, uh, now we have Praveen and we can close a round of questions and get back uh, to Max. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Praveen, you can. Yes, uh, thank you, Max, for a very insightful presentation and uh, uh, very critical ideas. Now, what I'm uh, doing is uh, to fly some kites along with the other colleagues uh, who have made some remarks. Um, the first is typology itself, yeah? Any typology is problematic. Uh, you talked of four typologies, you know, sort of those who have been tracking this uh, whole uh, uh, literature on uh, eco-socialism or ecology or environmentalism. We know that, I mean, you know, the typology uh, uh, that we have, that we have inherited are of many kinds, yeah? And um, so that of course is a challenge. And some of the uh, responses to you were uh, uh, towards that, you know, how do you sort of uh, 
but that is always a work in progress it always remains so uh, we cannot do without typologies so i see the logic of it but you know when we say uh, let's say deep ecology a uh, deep ecology can very well be a deep ecology of the right a deep ecology of the left then you basically have to start filling yeah so in that sense um, i see the value of what you were doing but i i i think we probably uh, need to think a uh, lot more about uh, many of these labels many of these uh, kind of uh, you know pigeon slots and so on and so forth uh, that's a small point but i wanted to you know certainly talk about that uh, i think the question which keeps bothering me more than anything else is uh, that of uh, what paris already hinted the contemporary power structure yeah i mean uh, we talked of monopolies and uh, you know i mean we know that uh, if you go by uh, tni's last sort of ranking of uh, the economic powers yeah the top 100 economic entities in the world in terms of revenues 71 are corporations 29 are countries of the top you know 100 entities now that is the world that we have right and here is a deadly mixture of very powerful mixture of very very solid mixture of you know imperialism and transnational uh, power you know through these co you know co uh, corporations and um, so on now how does one then think of whatever you know call it whatever deal you want to call it yeah without putting that on the front burner what are the let say the first few steps okay as i said i mean in that sense you know what ricardo was trying to hint at this this whole uh, imperialism and how that makes it uh, uh, so difficult for uh, uh, the so called uh, you know national project etc to confront that essentially that was uh, that is it, it was in that spirit that i read his uh, uh, remark so to my mind that is absolutely central in thinking aloud on any possible alternatives in terms of you know a few concrete ideas now whatever we have there's so little it's so much on the margin it's it's kind of you know we talk of uh, some of these things almost as if they're doing tango on the periphery right now that doesn't help so really the, the question is that of uh let's say the first few elements of the political blueprint right that brings me to the third kind of concern which all of us were grappling with this whole uh, let's say the national question now of course there is national question of the right there is national question of the left national question of the liberation and so on and so forth national question of the right becomes completely subservient to the logic of imperialism even though it speaks in a very different language <laughs> right it can descent you know it's, it 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 very easily descends into a fascist project as we have known in uh, uh, you know as 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 marcelo was hinting at as uh, you know we uh, experience it in india and so on so you know sort of that again uh, has to be taken to the next stage in terms of uh, what should be the politics of of the national liberation movements have to be will have to uh, sort of uh, chalk out a certain strategy and so on so here you you again have a huge uh, uh, sort of uh, legacy of thinking i mean the likes of samir amin who always uh, or or prabhat patnaik uh, from india and and and, and many others sort of who essentially are looking at that delinking as being absolutely necessary but it's not delinking from the rest of the world but as in terms of that neoliberal project yeah and then 
making the linkages in terms of a true progressive, you know, all these are within quotes, uh, progressive uh, agenda and so on. Yeah. What would be the possibilities of that given the situation at the current juncture? Because for them, being trapped in the neoliberal globalization is a complete disaster. It's, you know, it doesn't take you anywhere from the point of view of, uh, but then, you know, sort of uh, getting back to, uh, let's say, the nation state and the national project uh, in some confined manner, again, will not take you very far. Yeah, Maybe for some large countries like India, China, Brazil, and so on and so forth, maybe some distance can be covered. Yeah? But then there's this huge challenge, then how do you, so questions of regional cooperation and so on, uh, uh, sort of, uh, an Indian novelist, uh, Naipaul, used to say, he said it in 1950s, in fact, that uh, the world is full of million mutinies. The only problem is there is no coherence. There is no coherence you know, between these uh, mutinies, so to say, so that they can actually become you know, a powerful revolution and so on. So basically, uh, I, I, what I'm drawing our attention to is the questions of the politics, yeah? which then can make this whole, you know, eco-socialism or new green deal or whatever we want to call it, etc., a much more substantive kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, vision, yeah, to which we look forward to. So. On that note, let me not take too much time. I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, sort of hear a little more on uh, some of these things. If uh, uh, you would like to share some quick thoughts, of course, you must have given a uh, lot of consideration to these things in your work. So yes, that was it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Thank you. and Paris for your questions. And Max, now the floor is yours. And with uh, to deal with this very complex and comments and uh, and the questions thank you yeah yeah so there's there's a lot of ground to cover um in terms of the the politics of in the north which are it was it was raised this question of the breaking the back of the monopolies uh, the you know the the level of anti-systemic struggle in the north um is far behind the level of consciousness, which also needs a great deal of work. So there is no capacity currently um, amongst uh, oppositional forces in the US uh, laboring classes or organizations to break the back of any monopoly, um, which, which is why it's not a New Deal agendas, except for that of the, the radical Green Party, which is kind of uh, barely has any support whatsoever. Uh, the it, it's very clear, um, and I uh, that one of the most essential monopolies which needs to be broken apart are of course the, the war industries, um, which are some of the industrial sectors which have actually remained in the north and remain subject to uh, worker contestation, of course, and with all their attendant. Uh, supply chains which extend and devastate the South. This is, um, I, I think this is the one uh, monopoly and which is on the agenda of people in the North because it's very clear that you can't do any, it's very clear that you can't, it's going to be very difficult to do something about the ecological question while maintaining decent lives in the North and also in the South unless you do something about the military industrial complex and try to move on. these specific monopolies. Uh, the, the problem, I think, is that these sectors are, uh, the, the problem is that these sectors need uh, a just transition, which is very hard to imagine precisely because at the current moment, they're not, they're not one, they're not involved in producing anything that is socially necessary for uh, uh, popular classes in the North. Um, uh, of course, they're ideologically invested in imperialism. I mean, so the, the organizing in these sectors is extremely difficult. Um, 
and so this is really getting a, a, this is getting at the question of northern climate politics. I mean, I think a more propitious ground for northern climate politics at the moment is uh, there is a kind of cooperative uh, or a network of cooperatives in the U.S. called Cooperation Jackson. It has the slogan uh, "Build and Fight, Fight and Build," um, which means building up uh, sector. a lot like uh, Southern informalized working class, um, building up forms of endogenous industrial capacity through fabrication labs, building up housing, um, using uh, local or regional material, uh, using uh, moving towards ecologically appropriate cleaning services, moving towards forms of cooperative farms and so forth. Uh, of course, these things have been tried in the US before, right? Um, the fact that they've been tried is not, I think, evidence, uh, any question of discarding them precisely because if we actually look at the historical record, the sector of U.S. organizing or one of the sectors of U.S. organizing historically, which has faced the fiercest state repression, has always been uh, black nationalism as it expected, uh, black nationalism through, um, which thought about economic nationalism, right? Um, so the question, it's not a question of failure. It's a question of uh, a norm. In Northern terms is what kind of forms of community production, what kind of forms of just transition are possible that would not necessarily imply exporting the costs of just transition onto the South, right? Because the two, uh, one has to, in, in the North, it has to be pushed upon people and it has to be encouraged to look both internationally and domestically simultaneously, enhance the quality of the use values available to people who are suffering from a great deal of poverty in the North, while also expanding the scope of uh, international solidarity and making sure to not further extract from the South in the course of this just transition. So I think there is, uh, I think agriculture and uh, land management are, have major roles to play there. I think sustainable manufacturing or forms of uh, um, a lot to offer. I mean, I'm not, whether that develops into a social movement entirely remains to be seen. It's not a social movement right now, but it is uh, at least an agenda of moving towards the substantive production of use values rather than the kind of arithmetical increase of exchange value, which is usually as directed by the corporations. I mean, I think this also means moving to, uh, uh, moving against planned obsolescence, moving to right to repair. So I think it's, um, you know, the Palestinian economist Adil Samara called this development by popular production. So it's actually at each stage in the develop the popular development process is an advance of uh, increasing the well-being of the of the working class while taking control of the developmental process. Um, and I think that it will be very difficult and it's always been difficult in the North to uh, to weld together uh, domestic redistribution and internationalism. And this is classically work. I think there's a lot more space for this in the South. Um, you know, part of what I am looking at in, in another research project is actually the, the Arab debate about appropriate technology. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I know that there was also a Latin American debate, and this was a direction that dependency theory took beyond kind of the diagnosis of problems into the proposal for solutions. And I know, you know, I think there's a Latin American version. I mean, I, I think there, I know there are elements of that from South Asia as well. I think this is a very important terrain to recover in terms of offering real developmental options for people, uh, the popular classes in the third world and also the first, right? Um, in terms of finding less ecologically devastating, but actually more socially, uh, psychosocially fulfilling um, and economically fulfilling uh, developmental options. I think this is, this is absolutely crucial both um, in terms of figuring out ways to act
or even factories around appropriate technology rather than inappropriate technology, which can also be factory takeovers or reskilling of people and uh, appropriate transformations uh, using uh, in-situ transformations of local materials. I mean, I think there's a lot of scope for that. I think there's a lot of architects and uh, engineers who are actually working on these projects, right? But it's actually, usually it's at a remove from um, a lot of left debates. And I think that there's a need to re-engage with that in the North and in the South. I mean, because uh, to the extent that there has been a distancing from it, at least, which I don't want to make a claim that there's been a distancing everywhere. I know it's not the case, but in many places there's been a distancing, whereas this is actually offering both the intellectual and the, in actually the physical material for just transformations, North and South. So I think this is very important. Um, I think this, um, you know, I think this begins to get into, I mean, I don't want to say too much, but I think, you know, at least, uh, I mean, I'm from the North, but a lot of, uh, and a lot of the Southern theory that makes its way to the North are around these things like themes of extractivism and so forth, which, you know, I think both uh, the political and social movements that are gathered around things like extractivism are talking about very important things that go back to uh, uh, Arshana's points about the unequal impacts of development in the South. I think these are absolutely vital. And uh, what is an engagement with them, uh, with the theories like that, that rips them away from the hands of the, in, of the NGOs and puts them back in the hands of projects which take account of the nation as the shield uh, for uh, popular development, which comes entirely from below and re reflect, reflects people's interests from below. And I think there needs to be, you know, there needs to be more of that. I mean, uh, I, I have not seen that many critiques outside of Garcia Lene, for example. Um, this, uh, this question of um, situating agroecology, for example, in a national liberation framework, right? And again, attentive to the internal uh, contradictions of, of agroecology, right? I don't want to uh, sidestep them again by accident. Um, but I, in fact, this was an agenda that came from Tunisia. Um, this kind of is, is where I got the idea, is that uh, it wasn't called agroecology, but what they were doing was agroecology within a dependency theory framework, right? And thinking about how to uh, activate the potential and intellectual interest and enthusiasm of the poorest people of the countryside, of the Tunisian countryside, who are completely neglected, um, and thinking about how that could be reinserted in a national liberation framework. Um, and I, I think that that is, uh, I think there needs to be, I think there needs to be more of that. Um, you know, in terms of, in, in terms of this question, um, you know, something else, at the, uh, there, you know, I think actually I've seen a lot in the last year or so, but um, it, it would be, you know, this question, I, I want to now return to, to Praveen's question before going on to th this last question of, of the Democrats and Biden and so forth. Um, you know, I think something that hasn't been brought out enough is that things like ALBA really were frameworks for regional alternative development, right? Um, that these were working from the situation of the Latin American states as they were, which were primary commodity exporters, uh, which were partially deindustrialized with large informal working classes. And both ALBA and also the barter exchanges that went along with ALBA were part of creating the basis for, for an internal market. I mean, I think these are the possible steps that can be taken by small peripheral countries outside of the major ones like Brazil or India. Um, or possibly South Africa. I mean, I, I think that the, you know, in countries like Tunisia need to look similarly as well, look regionally again, because this is actually, in, it hasn't been lost necessarily at the level of the popular level, or uh, there's elements of people talking about it at the left, but it doesn't seem like a live option to people. And I think that is really one of the astounding and under-remarked things that was recovered uh, through Latin American reinvigoration and resurrection of the national question through the anti-systemic projects of uh, Chavez and, um, and Morales um, and Correa and so forth. I mean, and I think this is something that it, it would be beautiful to see more, more engagement with. Um, 
and I, you know, I've, I apologize. I've taken these questions because they were like scattered all over the landscape. And so I've, I've been a bit scattered in reply. Um, this last question, um, which cuts back into uh, of, uh, uh, of Paris about what are the prospects for further anti-systemic activity in the North uh, in the current conjuncture with, uh, with the Biden presidency. Um, you know, I think this, this connects very much to what is being done um, in, in places like Cooperation Jackson. I mean, I think there's a, actually a large interest in uh, progressive, and I mean that this time in a positive sense, of uh, rural resurgence in, in the US. I mean, there is a radicalization of um, large elements of uh, the Black struggle and the Indigenous struggle. Um, and I think what needs to be constituted, uh, both ideologically, intellectually, and politically, all at the same time, all of them reinforcing each other, is an autonomous third force in uh, US politics that builds in cooperation with the South and can enter on principal terms um, the pre-existing South-South dialogues and figure out how to be, uh, you know, how the US radical forces can be comrades to people in the South because that is currently not the agenda. And um, I think that's one of the most important things we need to figure out how to do. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Max Eyal, for uh, your presentation and your, your comments. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful event when, where we could really share perspectives, comments, and, and, and improve our uh, dialogue. And uh, it's, it was really nice to have you as part of our network debates. And uh, literally when we are looking forward to read the book and probably in the future to, to have you back in order to uh, comment on the book, to comment and to discuss uh, the whole book as a, as a project of, that we see is just, uh, we just, uh, we could listen to it. Uh, uh, a little bit of it and, and thank you again for uh, joining us this morning and thank you very much for everyone who has joined us uh, especially and I, I think we would like to thank uh, all the listeners uh, and the ones uh, who watching uh, us and joined the conversation through Zoom uh, and uh, Facebook. Uh, it's very important to thank our supporting partners uh, and especially uh, our logistic team uh, uh, team from uh, uh, like uh, we we have to mention uh, the, the the work from uh, uh, Joseph Matai, Freedom Was, we uh, Nabajit Malaka, uh, Esha Chaudhry, e e uh, Priyanka Kudar, and Judith uh, Kambanko. As they are supporting us in this initiative, without them we couldn't be <laughs> connected in different parts of the world. As I said before, uh, it's it's very good to be. Uh, in a tricontinental uh, group where we are from, uh, we, we are in different parts of the world. Some of us are, are finishing our working day as uh, we, we had a journey already. We, we have been uh, exploited in, in this new uh, way of joining uh, uh, debates and teaching and researching through internet for the whole day. It, as in India and in Brazil, we are just beginning our days in, in uh, most of Africa. Uh, we are in the late afternoon uh, and it's, it was very good to, to, to have you all with us. And I would like to announce our next session uh, that will be on the 16th of December uh, uh, with Professor uh, Dr. Lynn Awesome from the Makarei University, uh, uh, who will speak on the COVID-19 and the insights of the Agrarian South. Uh, this will be the, the, our final session for the year uh, of the, our dialogue series. And in the, in the same day, during the same event, uh, we'll be launching uh, uh, the research bulletin of the Agrarian South Network. So we, uh, you are all invited to join us on the, uh, in two weeks time and uh, it was really, really great to have you all with us. And thank you very much for all the participants, Professor, Professor uh, Ajana Passad, uh, uh, Dr. Max Ayo, and uh, all the support, uh, supporting team from different parts of the world. Thank you very much. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you.